The 1940s foresaw a big change in the world. The Second World War had ended, but a new war was about to get even colder. There was a change in social status for women's rights, and in general, music was changing for the better. Everyone was getting back on their feet. The 1940s will also see a great change in the railways too, as the war had taken its toll and a radical strategy had to be employed in order to get the railways back on their wheels. In the late 40s, the big four railway companies, the London and North Eastern Railway, the Great Western Railway, the London Midland and Scottish Railway, and the Southern Railway, all took part in the famous Locomotive Exchange Trials to see how well locomotives from different parts of the country would perform in different parts of the country. The trials were mostly successful, and ultimately, the railway board had come to the decision to unite all the big four railway companies as one whole unit, British Railways. They employed a Mr. Robert Riddles as chief mechanical engineer to help rebuild the railway that was war damaged and neglected. And part of this plan was building a full range of 12 brand new steam locomotives. And this meant all the locomotive workshops were getting busy, starting to build all the new locomotives, whilst at the same time, rebuilding and reallocating some of the older engines. One of these workshops and locomotive sheds that was a part of this plan was the well-renowned Brighton Sheds. Originally built for the London, Brighton and South Coast Railway in the late 1800s, it later became one of the biggest railway workshops on the Southern Railway in the 1920s and 30s, and now it is building new locomotives for a new generation. Brighton Sheds was right next to the central station, and therefore it was a real hub of activity, with many locomotives coming and going, staying and resting, being cold and watered. Many engines were allocated to the shed, and many were just long-term visitors. And one of these engines is 222 Squadron. 222 Squadron is a large Battle of Britain class locomotive, but prefers to be called Johnny. He is a Pacific type engine designed by Oliver Bullitt and painted in a lush Brunswick green livery. He is one of the light Pacifics who runs around the south of England pulling fast express trains. Johnny is one of the younger engines at the shed, with a lot of life in him. He was only recently built in 1945, and therefore he is very eager, and most of the time, rather positive. But he's also an intelligent engine, having vast amounts of general knowledge, thanks to his driver, who has a sister who works in television. So therefore, Johnny knows a lot about what's going on in the world, and this makes him think he knows more about the world than any of the other engines do. And in his words, the times are changing, and the more you know, the more you'll be able to keep up to speed. But Johnny is going to find out that this is not necessarily the case. Episode 1 Suburban Struggle it was a warm spring day at Brighton Sheds in the year of 1951, and the engines had now got used to nationalisation. They were very comfortable with the railways now being united as one, as it was not just railway companies that had united, but also various industrial companies are working more closely with British Railways in order to distribute and deliver more goods. And this involves using each other's locomotives. That is why, on this day at Brighton, we see a small 0 tank engine named Rafferty, who was just resting in the yards after a hard morning's work of shunting for some of the goods engines. He was just simmering in the shade, personally content, until he noticed something rather surprising, as he spotted a large black 044 tender engine with red and white lining, standing inside the shed, blowing off steam majestically. This surprising sight of a vintage engine turned into curiosity for the little blue tank engine. Hey, Albert. Yeah, Rafferty. What's up? Just a quick question. What's a massive old timer like that doing in our fine shed? He's quite a sight to behold. Oh, yeah. He's a fine sight, isn't he? I don't know his name, but he's come down all the way from Travistock. I hear he's going to be doing work down here for a while. You could go and introduce yourself, Rafferty. 
I'm sure an engine like that won't bite or, you know, bump your buffers or something. <laughs> well, let's get those wheels moving and introduce ourselves then. Oh, driver Larry, do you think you could move us next to that engine outside the shed? The one with eight wheels on his tinder. Why do you want to do that, Raph? Just wanted to introduce myself to the newcomer. Oh, okay then. Just give me a moment, mate. So Rafferty and his crew made their way over to the shed, alongside the new arrival. As he rolled past the little engine into the late morning sun, Rafferty felt a bit shy all of a sudden at the sight of this new face. Um, hi, um, nice day. Um, I'm Rafferty. I hope you don't mind the intrusion. Not at all, my dear engine. You've made no sudden intrusions whatsoever. In fact, I've been longing to talk to someone ever since I got here. Perhaps not many of the engines here are prolific conversationists. Oh, don't worry. All the engines here love to chat, have a laugh after a good joke. I think they'll be surprised when they see you. Really? And why would they think they're graffiti? Nice name, by the way. <laughs> well, uh, I mean, you're, you're a T9 class engine, and most other engines wouldn't expect an engine of your type to be so far down from the southwest. Sorry, I, um, I didn't catch your name, Mr... Nicholas. And thank you for asking. <laughs> and you don't have to call me Mr. Rafferty. Save that sort of address for the Board of Directors of the British Transport Commission. But I absolutely understand my fellow engine. I'm pretty far from home, literally. Yes, driver stock, that's quite a distance to travel. But I expect that the T9s were rather fast engines back in the old days, the London and South Western were we. But I come from so far up north, I'm not really caught up with my Southern Railway history. Oh no, you're right on point there, Rafferty. We weren't exactly breaking any records back then. We were fast enough to be called the flagships of our railway, yes. Not literally, of course. But that's how it was in the old days, and a lot has changed. I had to get with the times. How shocking is that? <laughs> well, I'm glad you're here, Nicholas. It'll be nice to have an engine around who's had a few years under his wheels. You could teach the young engines a thing or two and... Rafferty's sentence was suddenly broken off at the sound of a loud bullet whistle surrounding the shed. Good morning, everybody. I'm back from Victoria. Speaking of which, how's it going, Johnny? I take it from your high-pitched voice as you enter the yard that you had a good run? I did. Thanks for asking, Rafty. I think that was one of my best runs yet. I think I was running really well, and I think I was reaching up to the speeds of 90 miles per hour. I bet I made British Railways proud, and I bet my passengers had a good time as I was speeding along the line. <laughs> they, they must have been thrilled. I don't think that's a necessity. I expect your passengers just want to get to their destinations on time and safely. Making them thrilled, as you say, is not the best mindset when it comes to running trains. Uh, I'm sorry. Who's this? Johnny, this is Nicholas. He's going to be working around here for a while. Oh, I see. Well, nice to meet you, but just two things I must ask. First off, what kind of engine are you? You look like something that's come out of an old railway painting they hung up on the station master's office. I'm a T9 engine. I used to work on the London and South Western Railway from 1899 and eventually came into the Southern Railway when it was all grouped up, so to speak. Oh, you're a pre-grouping engine. That's right. I used to be an express engine. Like you, as a matter of fact. But nowadays, I'm just rostered to suburban work on all the branch lines in the Southwest. I bet you missed the good old days, when you could go fast and go flying on the line. <laughs> Why, I don't miss it. Well, maybe at first, when I was first built. There is a reason my class were nicknamed Greyhounds. But as time goes on and you learn more about the world of the railways, it becomes a matter more of responsibility, reliability and comfort. Well, you do make a good point. 
But that fact was only true like 80 years ago. People weren't exactly in a hurry to get anywhere. And what exactly are you implying there, young engine? Whoa, be careful, you two. Nicholas, you seem like a very nice engine. And Johnny, you're smart enough to know you shouldn't go around getting into arguments with the older engines. Or tall, for that matter of fact. I know, Rafferty. But it seems that old Saint Nicholas here doesn't quite understand that the modern day railways are no longer divided and all united as one. I am fully aware of that, young Johnny. I wasn't built yesterday. Yes, that is correct. You were built in the 1800s when the greatest thrill was travelling through the remote countryside to a distant town or city behind a massive machine with four massive wheels making its way to its destination. But today is a different story. The greatest thrill that men and women can experience is to fly through the sky in massive machines with propellers. But their greatest thrill is also our greatest threat, with massive unions threatening war once again and market air travel becoming more and more competitive. The railway has to become competitive as well. So that means being faster, trying to catch the eye of our customers. Horse-drawn carts face the exact same thing about the steam locomotive as you do about aeroplanes. But that is no excuse to give passengers a certain kind of experience just to get their attention. All passengers want to do is to get to their destinations and that is the exact same for goods. And since you are part mixed traffic, you should understand that too. I am not mixed traffic. And I am not stuck in my ways. Which, my dear engine, is exactly what you are trying to imply. I could think of a number of reasons why I should retaliate against your rudeness just now, but thankfully I'm more civilized than that. And I think this introduction has gone the completely wrong direction. I think so too. I'm just so, you know, I don't want to cause any offense. But if you don't change your ways and viewpoints in the world, it's gonna bite you on the buffers. And with that, Johnny blew a large cloud of steam and rolled into the shed. Nicholas looked exhausted. Rafferty felt bad. I'm sorry about his attitude, Nicholas. I mean, I've only known him for about five years now, and he's usually never like this with the other engines. I think sometimes he thinks he's a bit of a knowledge box, and I think you might have a thing or two for pre-grouping engines. No, that's alright, Rafferty. I've been around long enough to see far worse engines than Johnny, and those types of engines usually don't stay around for that long. But it looks like Johnny isn't going anywhere anytime soon. But he seems like a clever sort of engine to have an opinion like that. So that is why I am content that his comeuppance will bite him in the buffers eventually. Don't you worry yourself, Rafferty. His attitude will change towards me. Oh, I really hope his attitude does change. But what Rafferty didn't realise was that Johnny and Nicholas would both get their comeuppance as a result of their own opinions. And for Nicholas especially, it was to happen sooner, rather than later. Later that afternoon, Nicholas was travelling along the London to Brighton line with a suburban train comprised of three new Mark I coaches to Haywards Heath. All was going rather well. Nicholas was puffing down the line without any care in the world, passing through all the beautiful sights of the Sussex countryside along the way on his journey, giving his passengers a smooth ride. Nicholas was rather pleasant. But then... <laughs> uh, Driver Charlie, is that man holding a red flag up the line side? You know, I believe it is. Jack, quickly, prepare to stop. Oh, right, all right. So the driver shut off the valves, applied the vacuum brake, and they came to a gentle stop, a few yards beyond the man. The man came up to Nicholas's cab, whilst the guard came down from his guard's van at the back of the train. Hello there, Charlie. What's going on here, then? 
It's a bit of a complication, I'm afraid, Percy. Turns out that even though we had a splendid run, we didn't keep up to time. And according to the timekeeper over there, our path has to now pave way for a freight train. The passengers aren't going to like this. Some of the people on board have places to get to. The driver was right. The passengers were looking out of the window and shouting at them to carry on. Oi, oi! Get a move on! I have to be at a meeting soon with all the members of County! And I need to be at home in time for lunch! What on earth is the hold up? Well, I do apologise. I was trying to be as efficient as I possibly could. <laughs> Don't worry, Nicholas. This delay was no fault of yours. Well, whose fault is it then? I mean, there is a timetable and a schedule, and we have to be within certain paths along the line so we can keep on going. And now we've missed hours. And now... And now we've got to make up for lost time. Nicholas was right. But he also felt baffled that this could happen. But he knew he couldn't do anything about it as the freight train rolled past. And after it was out of sight, the signalman gave them the right of way. And they continued to make their way to the next station. I really do hope we can make up for lost time. I really do hope so. But unfortunately, the Greyhound was still four minutes behind schedule. And so, another engine was arranged to take Nicholas's place to make up for that four minutes. But it was a real shocker to Nicholas that the engine that was to take his place was a certain engine number 34078. <laughs> Hello there, old timer. Why, I am surprised. I was wondering if I was wrong and it wasn't about the speed and the thrill, but I'm delighted that that wasn't the case. Take my advice, Nicholas, and change your way of thinking. It's for the benefit of British Railways. Nicholas said nothing and didn't express any sort of rage whatsoever. As the lava smug baffled prison ran round the platform, back down onto Nicholas's tray. And with a loud whistle, he set off to Haywards Heath Station. Later in the shed that night, Gravity was once again witnessing the sight of two engines debating and causing a bit of a stir twice in the same day. I don't understand. You have no right to question my way of thinking when it was clearly justified from the incident that transpired today. That situation could have happened to any engine. No, in fact, that situation could have happened to anyone. Except it didn't. It happened to you, old timer. So who is the more educated one now? Oh, it's a question about education now. Well, I was under the impression that you were just being rather stubborn. Especially since that suburban struggle has never happened to me before. I'm not stubborn. Don't say these things like you know me, you don't. You've only just got here, and to be quite frank... Okay, just stop it, you two. Everyone around the yard can hear you right now. I, I just don't understand this. Why would you be so insulting, Johnny? This is not like you. What's the matter? Nothing is a matter with me, Rafty. I just don't want to be- You just want what? You want to say that you're right? Well, in my opinion, I think Nicholas isn't right. I'm sorry? And neither are you, Johnny. Uh, what? Both your opinions on how to run effective services are both within fact. But right now, I don't care because both of you need to find some sort of common ground. Nicholas, you're a wise old engine. And Johnny, you're considerably knowledgeable considering your age. Surely, a pair of engines like you can work something out and learn from each other. You're absolutely right, my dear fellow. But this green giant over here would rather see something more tangible until something happens. 
There won't be any common ground because this engine is not willing to listen or think about it. I am always willing. Ask anyone round here, but not like this. Good night. And with that, Johnny went crossly to sleep. A little while later, Nicholas and Rafferty did the same. It was a much sunnier day early that morning as Johnny raced through the countryside with his early morning express. The determined engine was giving it his all, trying to not be on time, but early, just to prove to Nicholas that he was wrong. And at the speed he was going, Johnny could have easily succeeded. That was until he felt his train getting heavier and heavier. Uh, guy? Do you hear something? It sounds like screeching sounds. Like metal scratching against metal. You know, I do hear that and... Oh my sweet bright, look at that. The fireman went frantic and reached for the driver. There are sparks flying from the carriages. We have got to stop. Sparks? Oh, come on. Johnny was rather curious as he and his crew brought the train to a gentle standstill and went to talk with the guard. Don't worry about this, boys. <laughs> One of the passengers just pulled the emergency cord, complaining about the train going too fast, causing a disturbance and headache or something. What? Well, that's never happened before. But we can still make it on time, although that stop was rather sharp. Although Johnny only said that to himself. As they went on their way again, they shortly approached the tunnel. There was a frantic clanking sound underneath Johnny, and the driver brought the train once again to a standstill. A few yards short of the tunnel exit. The driver inspected the damage. Oh dear. It seems that the jolt from the carriages earlier on caused one of Johnny's chains to shuffle loose a bit. And it looks like they completely jumped over themselves. Oh no, oh no! That was really stupid of me. If I wasn't going that fast, that passenger wouldn't have pulled the cord. And now this has happened to me. Oh, I've been really, really silly. As Percy the guard went to go and find a telephone in one of the nearby houses, Johnny just sat there alone in the middle of the main line, realising how much of an arrogant and rude engine he had been. Soon the guard came back and told them that he had contacted the nearest signal box, and in turn, the signalman contacted one of the stations to send an engine to help. I put back the chains just a little bit so you can move, Johnny. But not under your own steam. The moving will be done by the engine that will come and get us. And what a surprise it was to everyone, as the engine that had come to Johnny's rescue was none other than Nicholas the Greyhound. Why, hello there, young engine. I see you're in a spot of bother. Would you like me to help? Oh, yeah. I mean, yes, yes. Oh, definitely, yes. Yes, I, I would really appreciate it. I'm so sorry about everything, Nicholas. <laughs> I forgive you, Johnny. We'll talk about it later in the shed tonight. In the meantime, let's see if we can get your train moving, shall we? Johnny smiled as they set off towards Brighton, with the old and the new side by side working together in the modern day. It was a real sight to behold. That night, Nicholas lived up to his promise, and the two engines cleared the air and spoke to one another. And by the time Rafferty got back, the two of them were chatting away like old friends. So you see, I'm not a bad engine. Honestly, far from it. I was just worried that you were one of those engines so stuck in their old ways. I had no idea that you had all this wisdom to share. 
I'm usually not bad at judging character, but with you, I was very stubborn. <laughs> That's all right, young one. You're just standing up by your beliefs. Trust me, I used to be a lot worse way back when I was your age. <laughs> really? Well, you could have fooled me. Well done, you two. Well done. Well, I think I'm really going to enjoy it here. I cannot wait to meet the other engines. Maybe even give them some of that so-called parting wisdom. <laughs> You're not wrong there, but you'll get to know them in time. But I'm glad that you helped me out with my own suburban struggle in a way. I do hope everything does work out. Good night, Nicholas. Good night, Johnny. But as Johnny rolled into the shed and drifted off into slumber, Gravity saw a rather concerned look in Nicholas's face as clearly, Nicholas had an uneasy feeling about something. Because the old timer knew for a fact that British Railways was a time of change, and greater challenges for the steam engines will eventually come to pass. But that's another story. As for Johnny and Rafferty, their story was only just beginning, alongside the newest arrival to the shed. Nicholas. The Greyhound. <laughs>